God bless you everybody. Happy New Year to you all. From our pastor and Brother Chris. <laughs> um, just a few announcements. Uh, we have some visitors. Uh, Brother Simon Abbott, is it? From England. And his family are here. Uh, how long are you here for, brother? A few days work. Okay. Um, and also there's a... Um, there's a lunch that Brother Albert's putting on, that the church is putting on for the end of the year and the bringing in of the new year. So that's at Brother Tony's after, after church. So if you don't know, just um, ask someone and follow them out, out there, the visitors. Um, also, it's new year. So uh, just from the deacon, a little announcement. Um, if we could just honour this place... Um, as a building, as a house of God. Um, when, we, when we gather here, you know, there's people praying, um, seeking God, crying out to God. Some are crying out to God desperately. So please, when you enter the building, um, not idle talk, joking or uh, um, eating, chewing, texting, if you could just refrain from that in this house, please. And... Um, uh, it's just in respects to the Lord and to the respects to your brother and sister because they're seeking God, you know. So this is a house of the Lord that's dedicated to the, to the Lord that he may come and move. And you cannot see, but there's angels all around this place. You know, we're insensitive sometimes, so please just be a little bit respectful to the Lord when you enter this place. And... Uh, um, Brother Simon Abbott, would you like to bring a greeting from England? or from me? Would you like to come up here for, for a couple of minutes and then I'll hand it over to Brother Albert? This is Brother Simon. <coughs> greetings all. So, greetings from my father who was here I think a year and a half ago, Brother Jeff. I think he even sped, said something, I think. I think he spoke shortly, briefly. And greetings from our pastor in uh, Pickering. That's in the northeast of England. That's where we're from. It's a little group, maybe the same size as you guys here. Um, yeah. But it's been, uh, we've been, in, I think we've been away six weeks so far. And um, we've got another week to go. So it's the longest we've ever been from home, but uh, we've met loads of believers and People of like faith, and we're really thankful of that. So uh, just, yeah, just keep pressing. The time is time is uh, coming to an end. There's not so long to go. It's on the last the last track, and um, I know some people like to think that it's a marathon, so you've got to take it steady. But when I was younger, I used to do the races, and on the long 1500s, you'd come around the last lap, and you'd give it everything you've got. And that's kind of where we need to be. Just give everything we have to the Lord. Amen. Just surrender everything and just be more serious. Because Brother Bonham, when talking to these, when the Lord was, you know, before, before the deeper to go further with the Lord, the angel of the Lord said to Brother Bonham, you've got to be more serious. And that is a heavy thought because he was so serious. And we now, at the end of time, at the time of the translation, we need to be ever so serious. So I'm just really thankful that the Lord's going to work in our life and He's working in our lives all together as the Bride of Christ. And it's just wonderful to be amongst you. So, yeah, just pray that the Lord blesses this day and speak to us and give us something, Lord, for our journey onwards. So, God bless you, my brother. <laughs> Uh, what city are you from, brother? Pickering, boy. Pickering, okay. In England, so uh, Lord bless you. And uh, Brother Albert, can you take over service, thanks? Well, God bless you all. It's good to be together again. And uh, I was quite uh, inspiring, this little thought. You know, give it all at the end. And when you think about the Lord Jesus Christ himself, he really had to give it all. 
lay it all down. That's what it was. Amen. Let's just pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for bringing us together this morning. And Lord, we are here to worship you and praise you and, and meet with each other, declaring that we have faith in you, that we're believing in the coming of Jesus Christ and, and believing that we are a Savior and God. I just pray that you would have your way in this meeting this morning, and that it would be all for your glory. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Let's just uh, sing a few songs and then we have a baby dedication. <laughs> Let's start with, um, we bring a sacrifice of praise. We bring a sacrifice of
Um, Albert and Rhoda bring their new child, Bethany Kate, to be dedicated to the Lord. Now we know that dedication of children, uh, many people sprinkle them and so-called baptize them, but there's nothing in the scripture like that. And so we try to stay with what the scripture says. And there's only one place we find where children are brought to the Lord. And I'd like to read that to you. That's in Mark 10, verses 13 to 16. The Bible says here, And they brought young children to him, that he should touch them. And his disciples rebuked those that brought them. But when Jesus saw it, he was much displeased. And said unto them, Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. And he took them up in his arms, and put his hand upon them, and blessed them. Isn't that wonderful? You know, they brought children and infants to Jesus that he might put his hands upon them and bless them. Now, we are not Jesus here, but in the representation of him, we do the same thing. I believe that if Jesus would be standing here, that Albert and Rhoda would take Bethany to Jesus. I'm absolutely convinced. You see, to dedicate your child to the Lord publicly is also a declaration of what the parents have done themselves in the water of baptism. Repented, baptized, and dedicated their lives to the Lord. So declaring to live your lives for the Lord Jesus Christ. Having Bethany Kate now as part of your family, your desire is, of course, that she be blessed of the Lord and would also find the way meet the Lord. And you know, doing this is an expression of faith that we believe in the living God. I believe so too, otherwise it's just an old ritual with no meaning, but God answers prayers. So let's just pray. Heavenly Father, I do thank you for Rhoda and Albert and their family. And now the addition to the family, Bethany, Kate, and you bless them with this little girl. And I do pray that the blessings of God be upon her Amen. all her life. Lord, that you keep her in good health and strength, and that she may find you as Lord and Savior at a young age. I just pray for the parents that you grant them wisdom in the upbringing of the child, and I commit it into your hands. In the name of Jesus Christ, again, Ask your blessings in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you. God bless. God bless you. Thank you. Well, I'd rather do this in funerals, but uh, that's lovely. Praise the Lord. Just any day now, our Lord is coming. Let's sing that one. Each time I stop the take the time to look at me, I see the signs of his appearing.
going to see the king. Amen. Soon and very soon we are going to
Bible says there's no God. Some people say, the Bible says there's no God. The fool saith. It says afterwards. The fool said in his heart. But we know there's no God like Jehovah. And we know Jehovah of the Old Testament is Jesus Christ of the New. So he takes that revelation. Let's sing above all. Let's sing that one to the Lord. Above all powers, above all kings, above nature and all created beings, above all wisdom and all the ways of
is so good. Let's sing this one. God is so good. sing it to you. Amen. It's a psalm I start to read, so we could sing it. Yes. Uh, but before we read the word of God, let's sing, Welcome Holy Spirit. Amen. And you know, that's a song, you should sing it like a prayer. You want to welcome him in your heart. You know, you can get distracted, you can get bored, you can uh, feel miserable, but it's between you and him. Amen. Welcome Holy Spirit. Expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. Amen. You may be seated. The expectation of the poor shall not perish forever. So there is an expectation. And you heard the saying, there is an expectation in the air. And sometimes we do expect something. And sometimes we go to church just because it's church. We're not expecting the Lord to come on the scene. We're not expecting to be healed. We're not expecting to see our children saved because we think it's just another church day. We should have expectation. We should have expectation because we have a living God. So expecting great things must be based upon the Word of God. Otherwise, it's just wishful thinking. We get a lot of that, you know. Uh, 
I met this man, I uh, used to visit him. He was a, he's an old man and he used to listen to these types of uh, prosperity gospel. And his wall was plastered with Ferraris and, and young women and posters of everything. And he said, I believe for it, I believe for it. You know, he just died in the hospital, an old man, without the Ferrari, without the young woman. Because it was wishful thinking. He was not expecting according to the will of God or the word of God. Otherwise, it will come to pass. So you can't expect the promises of God to come to pass in your life. You hang on to it. And every force that works against it, you know is of the enemy. So you have to be vigilant to know the word declares a peace that passes all understanding. Just for an example. And who wants to take that peace off you? It's the enemy. But you can't expect that peace because God said it. Even in the midst of a storm. Therefore, we must base our entire thinking upon having faith in the Word of God. Faith in the Word of God must accompany expectation. Yeah, I, I know it's, it's, uh, it's, it's basic, but it's true. Well, we come here this morning. What are we expecting? Are we expecting to meet with the living God? Amen. To have a deliverance or... Or to have an answer for a question. Yes. Or having a revival in our heart. We have yeah, to expect yeah, yeah. something. Sometimes we go and we expect to see visitors. Or we expect, oh, today we have baby dedication. You know, that can be a reason. But we should be expecting something of God. Yeah. Even to know His presence. Thank you know, you. I mean, that's a great hey. thing. You know, there's only two elements that control the world today. There's fear and there's faith. I'll read it from a quote. It says, Russia is trying to get everybody to fear them. And we're trying to get everybody to have faith in God. Now that's the difference. That two elements controls all nations, controls all people, controls all churches, controls individuals. It's either fear or faith. You know, when, when you go down to the bottom of it, it's true. Faith <laughs> brings the victory, you know. Fear doesn't do anything for you. Now, fear and value whatsoever. Did you know that? If you take it literally, fear, if you fear something, how good does that do for you? What, what good does it do? Nothing. You know, there's this example, if a man is on death row, and he knows he's going to get shot in the morning. And he's fearful the whole night. Do you think that does anything for him? You know, what good would it do if we have fear or worry about uh, whatever he may would fear? Oh, what about my wife and children? How are they going to live once I'm gone? You know, you know fear does actually do nothing. But you may say, what good is faith? What good would faith be? Faith could deliver me. You see, that's the difference. If you have faith, you know, God could deliver me. You know, there were three men went into the fire oven and said, look, the Lord can deliver us. But if not, we're willing to die for our Lord. You know, faith got them into the fire and Christ got them out of the fire. Isn't that wonderful? So faith has actually some value, but fear has absolutely no value. Faith could deliver me, but fear won't help me a bit. Fear just makes you all worked up and more nervous than ever. The closer it gets to the time to be shot, you know, or the time the bank manager wants money, or whatever it is. You see, fear makes you more worked up. But faith, there's something in faith. You know, you may fear, oh, I've got an exam at school. I don't know much about it, and you worry about it. That doesn't help at all. It doesn't help at all. 
You know, I can tell you a story. I was not even a Christian then. I was, well, call it this way, very full of myself. And when I had to sit my final exam for a week after my apprenticeship, I didn't learn, I didn't study, and I started to become fearful. And I tried to look through some pages and, you know, what do you haven't learned the last three and a half, four years, you will not learn in two weeks before the exam. And then I put the books away and I had faith and I prayed. I said, Lord, help me with this exam. So I had faith and guess what happened? I was the top of the class. Not because I was so great, but fear didn't do anything. Faith actually did it, the Lord. But I have to say, I wasn't faithful at all. I still kept on living my bad life just as before. But faith has some merit. Fear has nothing. So, so let's have faith. Faith could deliver me. But if it doesn't, what good would fear be anyhow? <laughs> you know, you say, well, if it doesn't work, well, how, how much does fear work? Not at all. So just stay right with faith and hold to, on to it. God, take God's promise and then remain with God. See, I put down here, man with his intellectual understanding tries to work out things. But by faith in God, within the heart, God will make you believe things that reason and man's wisdom could not achieve. Yeah. It's a very hard one. And I always said, if you have brains, if you have brains, it's even harder. <laughs> it's harder. If, if you... If you too, too dumb, say it this way, or too silly, or, or uneducated. I can't work these things out. It's actually easier to have faith because there's nothing else. Mm. But we always have this, our intellect to go back to. We can work it out. You know, we, yeah, I can do this, I can do that. That's us. And then it's very hard to so have faith and say, yeah. Lord, I surrender to you. Yeah. Oh, I just trust you with it, you know. No matter which way it comes. I trust you for the best, for what you have me to be and how things to go. So, you see, Hebrews 11, 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence, evidence of things not seen. Right. You know, how can you have faith in something that doesn't exist? <clears throat> you can't actually. You know, it's, it's, it's like bef <laughs> the saying, before there was a fin on the back of a fish, there had to be an ocean to swim in. And before you can have a desire <clears throat> to have your prayer answered from Almighty God, there has to be Almighty God out there. You wouldn't have a desire for Him. And you know, as you go on, yeah. you actually realize it is real. It is true. I don't know how long since you had a touch from the Lord the last time or a miracle happening in your life. I don't know. But if you had it once, God has not changed. You see, we sometimes forget, like Israel coming out of Egypt through the Red Sea and had all these miracles and then they were in despair and forgot so quickly about the mighty works of God. Others do something different. They take the mighty works of God, put on a pedestal, and worship the God of yesterday. Happens. They did that with the brazen serpent. Remember where all the snakes were? God made a way of escape, taught Moses to make a brazen serpent on the stick, put it up, and whosoever looks upon that brazen serpent is healed. There was in the desert where there were serpents. Once they were past there, there were no more serpents. But they carried that brazen serpent like an idol. And it was so bad that Hezekiah had to destroy it and put it to powder. Because it became an idol. And you know, looking just to God yesterday can become an idol. And how makes us to miss him today. 
So we don't want to idolize God of the past. We do idolize God full stop, you know, but uh, not looking to the past and make that an idol. You know, some people always talk about one thing. 30 years ago, yeah, I used to have this job. I used to do this. I used to whatever. It, looking to the back, 30 years ago, when I was young, I was quite a pretty girl, you know. <laughs> Could have been a model, you know, who wants to be, you know. But, you know, the mean, that doesn't do anything. Today, today, we need him. Today, we look to the living Christ. We believe by faith he is alive, by the Holy Ghost. So, you have to believe God's word. If you could just get that sunk into your heart, it would make the devil jump and leave right now. <laughs> That's a quote. The devil knows he's defeated. But if he can't keep us in unbelief, even if we confess with the mouth, I believe, I believe, but we don't in the heart, the devil has a heyday. But if he knows you believe, he's got to go. I'll read you <clears throat> Genesis 6 here from verse 5 to, to verse 8. <clears throat> we know the story quite well. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he made men on the earth, and it grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy men whom I have created from the face of the earth. Both man and beast and their creeping things and the fowls of the air, for it repenteth me that I have made them. What a thing. He wanted to destroy, he did, destroy everything. He created and said, yeah. it's no good. They, they, they don't do the right thing. Yeah, no good. But then it says in verse 8, but Noah found grace in the sight of in the eyes of God. That's a wonderful thing. Noah found grace, even amongst all the wickedness that's going on. I mean, you go out in the world now, you see all the wickedness, all the immorality. It's advertised, it's promoted, it's put into law, everything you see out there. Like it was in the days of Noah. Violence and sexual immorality, and that was the main ones. And they're right here. We see it. But Noah found grace in the eyes of God. And I believe we found grace in the eyes of God. We wouldn't even think about it or worry about it if we didn't have found grace. So the grace of God caused Noah to hear the word of God. See, when you hear, perceive, not just hear it, see it, but in the heart, yeah, that's true. That is the grace of God. When you can't receive the word of God, that's absolute grace. And when you can <coughs> receive it, there is victory. There is power. You know, I, I knew someone who, who was bound by some, some uh, <clears throat> well, troubled in the mind, said this way, and then found deliverance. The Bible said, those the sun sits free are free indeed. And suddenly it hit home. Then I'm free. And that person was free right then and there. Heard it many times. But then by the grace of God, it hit home in the heart. And then trouble was over. So the word of the Lord did not take Noah. Uh, sorry. And the word of the Lord did not take Noah out of judgment. That was to come, but made a way through it. I find that's quite interesting. The Lord did not take him out of it. It's like Jesus prayed and said, Father, I, I don't take him out of the world, but I leave him in the world, but I'm, I'm with you. You know, he left us here, but he didn't take us out and just to heaven for a purpose. But the Lord makes a way through it. 
it can be typed, of course, Noah being church natural and Enoch being the bride. We know that type. Enoch was raptured away before the flood. That types the bride of Christ, which goes before tribulation really comes. But it's not the main point I'm trying to make with this. I want to say the Lord will make a way through the problem. The problem was the Red Sea. He didn't take the Red Sea out the way. He didn't lift them all up supernaturally into a cloud and take them across. No, he opened the Red Sea and said, you walk right through it. Right through the trouble spot. You walk right through it. I love that. You know, he made a way through the trouble. He didn't say go around it. He didn't say make them fly over the top. No, he made a way through. <clears throat> to me, that's very important. You see, a problem person in your life, have you ever had problem persons in your life giving you a hard time? <laughs> you know, sometimes uh, you hear all these stories about mother-in-laws and different things. Problem person in your life. I'm not saying mother-in-laws are all bad. <laughs> not saying that. I call my mother-in-law mother-in-love. But anyway, it's, but some people have an issue with a certain person. And then they fight that issue constantly. And at the end, they walk away or shift away. But believe me, there's another person like that in a new place, sooner or later. You see, the problem is with you. You have to go work through the problem, not trying to escape every problem. You have power to love, power to overcome, and power to walk through the Red Sea. Amen. He gave them feet, Amen. not one feeble one was amongst them, the Bible said. He strengthened them all physically so they could go and walk through it. I find it's quite interesting. You see, I, I knew I knew a couple. They had a big marriage problem. And then I had to talk to, to the wife. And they said, are you absolutely convinced, absolutely sure the Lord told you to marry that man? And she said, absolutely sure. I said, look, then when you come to the trouble spot, to the Red Sea, everything turmoil, and the enemy in, in the back of you, the Lord will make a way through. Mm. You see, but people come to the Red Sea or to, to the place of no escape and then lose faith. But, you know, if, if people before Noah, uh, not Noah, Moses, had the, had the power of God to open the Red Sea, if they would have just said, well, God promised to lead us into the promised land. God promised it. And he does not lie. And he does not change his promise. If we just get a hold of that, God doesn't change his word. He doesn't change his mind. What he says, that's forever right. He does not need to find a, a better way uh, in a few years' time. No, he knows the perfect way. And if he promises you to take you to the promised land and you come to a problem spot, don't then look to the promise say, I don't know how, but God will take me through this. I don't know how. Have you ever been in a situation like that? Yeah. I don't know how I can go yeah. any further. Yeah. Yeah. But I believe he never will leave me nor forsake me. Yeah. And that's what you have to hold on to. Yeah. The promises of God and, you know, when a person even confesses with the mouth, God told me to marry this man, and they come to a problem spot, and then they leave the man, then, then I, I have my doubts where the faith is, or where the faith is in, you know. So I just want to encourage you to go by the promises of God, not to doubt them. It may not look like it. Just imagine you, you, you walk... And you come to a dead end, and the army of Egypt is behind you to kill you and slaughter you. It's not a lovely place to be in. <laughs> and you are got to get fearful and, oh, everything's finished now, it didn't work. No, what did God promise? Hang on to that. I'd like to uh, read you 
a bit more in, in the, from verse 13 in that chapter. And God said unto Noah, The end of all flesh is come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them, and behold, I will destroy them with the earth. Make thee an ark of gopher wood. Rooms shall thou make in the ark, and shall pitch it within and without with pitch. And this is the fashion which thou shalt make it of. The length of the ark shall be 300 cubits, the breadth of it 50 cubits, and the height of it 30 cubits. A window shall thou make to the ark, and in a cubit shall thou finish it above. Isn't that interesting? The window was above. So Noah could not look out into the trouble and the waves and the people being killed. He just could look up to the Lord that delivers them. You know, I think sometimes that's the best way to look. I, I, I once visited a, a sick man in a hospital. And I said, well, I said, when I didn't know what to say. So I said, just look up, you know, to the Lord. Look up. He said, nothing else I can do <laughs> you know he was lying on his back but you know sometimes that's the place where where Noah was in that's all place the only place he could look is up to the one who made the promise and gave him the instructions so and then and the door of the ark shall be set on the side thereof with lower second and third stories shall they make it and behold I even, even I do bring a flood of waters up on the earth to destroy all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. From under heaven, and everything that is in the earth shall die. But with thee will I establish my covenant. And thou shalt come into the ark, thou and thy sons, and thy wife, and thy sons' wives with thee. And of every living thing of all flesh, Two of every sort shall thou bring into the ark, to keep them alive with thee. They shall be male and female, of fowls after their kind, and of cattle after their kind, of every creeping thing of the earth after his kind. Two of every sort shall come unto thee, to keep them alive. And take thou unto thee all of all food that is eaten, and thou shalt gather it to thee, and it shall be for food for thee and for them. Now, just imagine if the Lord tells you something like that. <laughs> That's, I, I heard, I'm not, even, I'm not sure, but I heard, I think it took him 120 years to build that ark or something. A long time. Huge project. Just imagine. You have to be absolutely convinced you heard from God. And then when you start to build this ark and people come and say, what are you doing? What, what do you make this box for? There's no... He said, it's going to rain. Rain, what's that? It never rained on the earth. Did you know that? It never rained. The earth was watered by dew that came through the earth and by the moisture in the air. There was never rain before Noah was in the ark. So he would have had lots of critics and you know, when you, when you want to follow the Lord, you have a lot of critics. What a rubbish. Why do you do this? Why do you do that? You, you get criticized because people don't understand. People have not heard from the Lord or have had no faith in what God said. But Noah had faith. And he did exactly what God told him. He built this ark. And it took him years and years, you know, It says in verse 22, Thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him, so did he. I find that it's, it's a very important point. He did according to all that God commanded him. You know, I'm just talking generally. If you want to serve the Lord, and you start to serve the Lord, whether it is just in your life, or whether it is in a church situation, whether it is you feel led to preach, 
you will find you get flooded with advisors. Flooded. People telling you how you should be doing it, how you should organize it, how you should preach, what quotes you should read or not read, and uh, people tell you what you should be doing. And Noah did according to all that God commanded him. Not what man said, or no opinion. You know, one of his, his sons may have said, Hey, Dad, you know, that would be better if he put a bit of uh, a different wood in here, you know, that gets too heavy, or this is that, and, or make another floor, make a penthouse on the top, or make it a little bit bigger or a bit smaller. No, he didn't listen to all that. But I'm sure he had advice different to what God showed him in the vision. And we do get that too. If the Lord tells you something, do it according to what the Lord told you. And you get all this lovely advice from people. And I mean, I'm probably guilty of it myself, trying to advise people. But you know, just take what is of the Lord. What God tells you. <coughs> so, the, thus did Noah according to all that God commanded him. So did he. I'm sure every one of us has been told what we should be doing. Especially if you're in trouble or have worries or have, have a difficult time with people tell you what you should be doing. No, it's the Lord. Do what the Lord commands you. Now, as Noah had found grace with the Lord, so have the nation of Israel and the Gentiles been offered grace through Jesus Christ and God's election, through God's election and grace. We have been offered salvation, eternal life. Now, <coughs> we know Israel are the people of God. You can say they were, but what God has chosen, he does not throw away later on. He doesn't choose something or save you today to, to drop you tomorrow. That's right. not how God works. The devil might try to tell you, oh, he doesn't love you anymore because you failed or whatever. No, God chooses you, calls you, because I have called you by name, you are mine. Those he has foreknown, then he also called. And those he called, he also predestinated. You know, we have to hang on to that. So, Israel is the chosen nation of God. But Israel have rejected Jesus Christ when he came. They were blinded for our sake. But they are still the chosen nation. Uh, you know, Israel are the people of God. Those who have accepted the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ are the people of God. Just remember that one. Now I read you Deuteronomy 7 verses 6 to 10. For thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. The Lord thy God has chosen thee to be a special people unto himself. Above all people that are upon the face of the earth. Man, what, a, what an election. The Lord did not see, set his love upon you, nor choose you, because you were more in number than any people, for they were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you, and because he would keep the oath which he had sworn unto your fathers. Amen. Has the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand, and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen? from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Know therefore that the Lord thy God, he is God, the faithful God which keepeth covenant and mercy with them that love him, and keepeth his commandments to a thousand generations. Oh, that's quite a lot. And repayeth them that hate him to their face to destroy them. He will not be slack to him that hateth him. He will repay him to his face. So the Lord had chosen Israel, and they are still the chosen people. And he made a covenant with Abraham, which was unconditional. Not, if you do this, I'll be with you. 
No, I'll be with you. You see, that's the point. And Peter 2, 9 says, But you, you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into this, his marvelous light. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. Which in time past were not a people, that's us, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. <clears throat> you see, when we receive the Spirit of God, we will see things the way God sees them. We love the things God loves, and we hate things God hates. It cannot be any different if it's the same spirit in us. We may struggle with some things because of influence, of upbringing, or church doctrines or religions we have been brought up in. We may, may be, uh, uh, it may be suppressed, you know, to be uh, according to the Spirit of God. But if we have His Spirit, if we're born again, we love what God loves and hate what man hates. Uh, sorry, and hate what, what God hates, and we hate it too. So God, we know a very simple scripture, John three sixteen. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but has everlasting life. Now you think about that one. So if God loved the world, and we feel we're the chosen ones. We don't suddenly hate the world. We try to win them for Christ. If you can't have love for everyone, there's something wrong in you. Absolutely something's wrong if you can't love everyone. Because the Spirit of God is love, and you can love everyone with the Spirit of God. You may not agree with everything, sure. You don't love the bad things, but you love the souls, the people. So the Spirit of God will always agree with the Word of God. <clears throat> if God loves Israel, then you can only love Israel by the Spirit of God. I have been to a prayer meeting once, years ago, and I was in shock. There was this man, he hated Israel, and he called himself a believer. I've been in Switzerland, and one hated Israel even denying the Holocaust and everything else. I thought, man, you need the Spirit of God. Or stop listening to the wrong voices, whatever it is. How can we not be like God if he, God is in us? Yeah, you know, that's the point I'm making. So if God loves Israel, so will you if you're born of God. If you have hatred towards Israel, then you are either influenced by the world or you have not been born again. It's quite a statement, isn't it? I believe that. I truly believe that. You know, the world feeds you all the anti-propaganda and all these things. And some people can sympathize with, with the underdog and whatever and, 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 and take false reports and all sorts of things. It doesn't change the fact that God loves Israel. And God has called them and promised them to put them back in the promised land. And they are in the promised land. And there will be more vindication very soon. I'll read you Romans 11, 25 to 32, which makes it very clear. For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness in part is happened to Israel, until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. Do you know how close it is? Until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. There's gleaning time. One here, one there. But there's not the masses coming to Christ now. There's the odd one. And you know, Israel is back in their homeland. It won't be much longer. The moment he reveals himself to Israel... Grace is over for us. We are right on the brink of time until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. 
And so all Israel shall be saved, as it is written, There shall come out of Zion the Deliverer, and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant unto them, when I shall take away their sins. As concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes. But as touching the election, they are beloved for the Father's sake. Yeah, for the promise he made. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. He doesn't need to change his mind and say, oh, I made a mistake. No. For as ye in time past have not believed God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief, even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy, they also may obtain mercy. For God has concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. What a wonderful plan. He made a way for us to come in, but he hasn't rejected them for good. He will show mercy again. That's such a wonderful way he does things. Now expecting things of God will also be by the Spirit of God. You cannot expect things which are not there. A woman that is pregnant, listen to this, what is she? Expecting a baby. We know that. A pregnant woman is expecting a baby. Ask Melanie. She's waiting. She's overdue. She's expecting it. When does it come? But she's expecting it. She's ready for it. And if a person is pregnant, they do expect a baby. They don't expect a voucher in a, in a mail for a free holiday. They expect a baby. <laughs> and the believer must be pregnant with the word of God. I mean, it sounds a little bit, you know. But that must be in you in order to expect the promises to come to pass. You cannot expect the promises of God to, to come to pass in your life if you not have it in you. And a woman that is not having a baby in her is not expecting to have a baby in nine months. Unless she's not in the right mind. But you see, so the believer must be like pregnant with the word of God in order to be under expectation. I hope you, you know what I'm trying to say. So, the point I'm making this morning is we can expect the promises of God to come to pass. We have to put expectation into the things of God. I, I, I like to encourage you, have expectation with what He promised. Not what we wish or what we've heard, but what He promised. You can have expectation in that. And if Christ is in you, that will actually happen and your expectations will be uh, fulfilled. Shall we just pray? Heavenly Father, I thank you for this little time of meditation this morning. And Lord, we expect the things of God to come to pass in our lives. The things we commit to you, we expect that you answer our prayers. We accept, expect the promises of God to come to pass. We expect our children to be all coming to you and serving you and, and knowing you in the power of the Holy Spirit. We have a promise that we can bring them all under the token, that we can pray for them. And Lord, you never disappoint. You told Noah to build an ark. And he, he did it because he believed your word. And he expected a flood to come. So he did everything the way you told them, exactly according to your plan. And Lord, we know there is a rapture coming, there is judgment coming on the earth. I just pray, help us just to, to do everything the way you declared it in your word, to be found in the word of God and to, to be under expectation that we be transformed and raptured away. I thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I know the Lord will make a way for me. Let's sing this one. <coughs> I know the Lord will make a way
Thank you. 